Testament scripture lesson is from uh, the 19th Psalm. If you'd like to follow along, it can be found on pages 498 and 499 in your pew Bible. I'll be reading from the Revised Standard Version. Listen for the word of God. Psalm of David. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes forth like a bridegroom, leaving his chamber. And like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern his errors? Clear thou me from hidden faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Here ends the reading of the Old Testament, the scripture reading. I'm going to take a uh, personal point of privilege since it's my birthday and tell a really corny pastor joke. It's been a while since I've told one of those. So how do we know that God likes coffee? Because the book in the Bible called Hebrews, right? But, anyway. So the book that we're reading from today is James. It follows immediately after Hebrews and the uh, New Testament, uh, right before Revelation. So we're continuing James's letter. Uh, we'll be reading chapter 3, verses 1 through 12 today. And while we had the nice psalm of David that we heard uh, Bob read, and now we're getting a little more convicting information from uh, James, especially in the regards to taming of the tongue. My brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers, because we know that we teachers will be judged more strictly. We all make mistakes often, but those who don't make mistakes with their words have reached full maturity. Like a bridled horse, they can control themselves entirely. When we bridle horses and put bits in their mouths to lead them wherever we want, so we can control their whole bodies. Consider ships. They are so large that strong winds are needed to drive them. But pilots direct their ships wherever they want with a little rudder. In the same way, even though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts wildly. But think about this. A small flame can set a whole forest on fire. The tongue is a small flame of fire, a world of evil at work in us. It contaminates our entire lives. Because of it, the circle of life is set on fire. The tongue itself is set on fire by the flames of hell. The people can tame and already have tamed every kind of animal, a bird, a reptile, and fish. And no one can tame the tongue, though. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we both bless the Lord and Father and curse human beings made in God's likeness. The blessing and cursing come from the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, it just shouldn't be this way. Both fresh water and salt water don't come from the same spring, do they? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree produce olives? Can a grapevine produce figs? Of course not. And fresh water doesn't flow from a salt water spring either. Now this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In seminary, I took a class on uh, conflict, and I'm not sure why, because there's never really any conflict that occurs in churches. So, <laughs> so all, all kidding aside, 
It was a very intentional and focused class with the emphasis placed on checking a source when it comes to conflict. Or more specifically, kind of getting to the bottom of things. The reason for that is that frequently uh, conflict stems from something uh, different than what one is being told. Or there's an off chance that what's being explained is not really the issue at hand. Uh, sometimes there's something behind what's being told or even something a little deeper that's being explained to someone. So it helps to get to the bottom of what the real issue and trouble and conflict is at hand. Uh, for instance, if someone kind of uh, is living in an apartment and mentions they're frustrated with this giant neon sign that someone just put outside their window, uh, they might instantly jump to wanting to take it down, right? But what if the problem was a little simpler than that? What if it was just too bright? And it could be scaled back or dimmed a little bit. Or maybe use some LED lighting so it's not as bright. Or what if the humming noise was just too loud and it disturbed them when they tried to sleep or take a nap? Then maybe something could be done about that. Or what if it just obstructed their beautiful view of the ocean or a lake or a pond? And then maybe they could do something to fix that. You don't have to jump immediately to taking the whole sign down, right? And so another kind of sample scenario was given to me, and it happened to do with two college students sitting in a library. Uh, college student A was sitting there studying and reading some books for their math class, and they went to the window that was closed and opened it and said, you know, I want some fresh air. I want to hear the birds chirping and feel the nice cool breeze on my face. So they opened the window all the way up. Well, college student B, sitting a few feet from college student A, said, well, this isn't good. The window is too drafty. It blows all my mathematical equations all over the place. So I'm just going to go over and close the window. So student B goes to the window that's now fully open and closes it. Well, student A, a little perturbed, said, well, I want it open. So it went back and opened the window. So it went back and forth for about 20 minutes. Uh, window open, window closed. Until finally an intervener kind of came in and said, you know, what's the problem here? A student A said, well, I just want some fresh air and to hear the birds chirping outside. And student B said, well, the wind is just blowing my paper, or just blowing my papers all over the place and messing everything up. I'm trying to have it organized. Well, the intervener said, why not just have the window half open? Uh, it cut down the breeze. There was no longer any breeze, and the fresh air was still coming through, and the birds were still heard chirping in the background. Problem solved, right? You have to go to these extremes of opening and closing the window, just meet in the middle somewhere. <laughs> so that's what took place with that. Um, there was also another story that really stuck in my mind. Um, it was a video done by National Geographic about this little tiny village in Alaska. Uh, and these people had been fishing for hundreds and hundreds of years out of this river that would go through their town. And two months or three months out of the year, the fish would be abundant. They'd almost be jumping out of the river, migrating up the stream. Uh, so they would use these fish they would catch and store them for the entire year. Well, this one year they had a drastic decrease in fish. There were probably about one-tenth of the fish they normally see that came through uh, the river. So they panicked a bit, said, what are we going to do? There's, this is a big issue. We need the fish to eat and survive throughout the winter. And then about that same time, they saw hundreds of grizzly bears just showing up outside of their village. I thought, oh, well, this isn't good. They're probably the ones that are stealing all of our fish. So let's go and kill all the grizzly bears, and that'll solve our fish problem. Uh, so they started killing and calling all these grizzly bears, uh, probably killed hundreds of them. And then they realized that didn't fix the fish problem. Said, oh no, well, what's the real issue here? So they called in a scientist to kind of see and get to the bottom and the source of what really was going on. So the scientist did some research and the scientist went to the source, which was this lake that fed into this river where all the fish were born and usually hatched from their eggs. They found a little bacterium that was infecting the eggs, which drastically cut down on the fish that were being born and reproduced. Uh, which again cut down on the river supply that they would have for the fish through the town. You see, they wanted to blame the bears. But the bears were just looking for their own food supply too as it had dried up at the source. Uh, people panicked and didn't know what to do. But if they had called in the scientists ahead of time, maybe they could have skipped a few steps and found the real trouble brewing at the source of that river, that bacterium growing in the lake. So I feel this portion of James's letter is kind of in the same vein as this notion of checking the source of the conflict. 
You see, if we truly look at ourselves and look at that source, that will largely indicate how we are living in other areas of our life. What flows from this source is indicative of every source that flows from our bodies. That primary source being our hearts. You see, everything that comes from our minds and out of our mouths truly emanates from the source of our heart. The two are very tightly connected. Therefore, if we have a good and pure heart, then the thoughts that go through our mind and the words that come out of our mouth will also be good and pure. So acknowledging this helps us uh, refrain from wrongly placing the blame on someone or something else. Instead of saying, oh, it's the bears that's causing me to do this. Or how can I be expected to be kind to my coworker when they give me the cold shoulder day in and day out? We can instead point to ourselves and say, no, I am responsible for my actions. It's what comes from my source that dictates how I act. And if it hasn't been the greatest way, I'm sorry for that. And maybe I'll commit to a way to change that and alter that in life. But for example, do we find our patience kind of wearing thin? And notice that we become a little more easily frustrated. And maybe we should check our sores. Are we constantly thinking mean or maybe judgmental thoughts? We might want to check out our sores. Are we finding ourselves frequently being unkind or unfriendly or even intentionally mean or maybe violent towards someone or something else? But maybe it's time we checked our sores. You see, whatever the case may be, or whatever words we say or thoughts that we think, or actions that we take, we are solely responsible for our own actions. Nobody else. The yeah, our emotions may differ, and we can't control those, but we can control how we act and what we say, and sometimes even what we think or how we think about something. We can't deflect the blame, and in turn, we must look within ourselves, and particularly our heart, to discern the way in which we might be. So if we take a good kind of hard look at ourselves and we notice that our hearts are perhaps not the positive, good, loving source that we want them to be, don't worry. There's something we can actually do about that, believe it or not. There are things we can do, but it requires that word that none of us really like to hear in life, change, right? That's that hard C word that comes up from time to time. But first, though, we have to be honest with ourselves. Even if it's a tough realization and an acknowledgement to make, we have to be 100% sincere with ourselves as only we know what it lies in our source. We can't hire a scientist to go in and look and see how our source is acting. We know, God knows, but we alone know what's in our source. So from there, if we feel that our source is perhaps tainted, then we need to take appropriate steps to correct that. Of course, there are both spiritual and practical steps that we can take, right? And spiritually, we can pray more, we can read the Bible more, we can attend church more regularly or participate in the life of the church in some form or fashion. But practically, there are some steps we can actually take, too, to kind of peel back the callousness or wash away the darkness that might be covering our hearts. But first, maybe we should try to be more positive in life. Again, that's easier said than done, but maybe we can be more optimistic, more hopeful, and tell ourselves of the immeasurable gifts and blessings that we have in life, instead of thinking of all the negatives that might exist. So whether it's waking up each morning and telling yourself that you are fantastic and awesome, as I've told you guys to do a few weeks ago, or just having that mindset of, today's going to be a great day. It's going to be a hopeful day, a day filled with love and joy and kindness. We're just trying to put a positive spin on things differently in life. We have to be more positive. And slowly but surely, we can kind of change that source within us. Another method is to be compassionate to yourself. That's right, don't always be so hard on yourself. Feel free to give yourself mercy and grace and to make mistakes and to make wrong decisions in life, I can assure you that most of the mistakes we make, the world will still stand, right? The world's not going to end. Sometimes it might kind of feel that way, but the world will go on. We'll have another day. So be compassionate with yourself. Give yourself a little bit of grace and trust that in the end it will all be okay. 
Uh, lastly, and this is probably the hardest one, and I'm not sure we can really do this one. Uh, we are very much creatures of habit. But try something new. Right? That, that's hard. And the thought of that, uh, I don't know, Pastor Chris. Can we, can we really try something new? There's a lot of different things in life, and I'm comfortable how I am. But maybe during this week, you can talk to the local store clerk checking you out, the barista at Starbucks, or your neighbors, or people you're unfamiliar with in your workplace. Now strike up a conversation. Even if people are yelling at you to hurry up, I'm trying to pay for my groceries here. Talk to the cashier. Talk to the person in public stocking the shelves. Now, studies have shown that if we really work on relationships that we don't have a strong ties with, these weaker people, or not weaker people, weaker relations, uh, you know what I mean, uh, where relationships not strong, I'm not calling these people weak, about people that we don't have a strong relationship with, if we work on those weaker relationships, we begin to feel happy. And I can assure you that person will feel happy as well. Even come talk to Pastor Chris. If you feel we haven't chatted in a while, give me a call. Uh, send me a text or an email and say, hey, let's talk, or let's go to lunch, or let's have your giant chocolate bar and talk about sports. Or maybe we could attend an art show or go to a play, or maybe a recital, or even attend a sporting event that we're not comfortable with all the time. Try something new. And I guarantee you that your heart and your mind will be open to see something from a completely different perspective. You know, kind of ironically, it was this very uh, passage that I preached my very first sermon here at TPC. Uh, that trial Sunday. I don't know if you, you that were here remember that, but the title of that sermon was Strawberry Milk. I talked about that being my favorite drink, and someone actually got me strawberry milk, so that was kind of fun. Maybe I should just name my sermons all food names and get something at the end of the day. <laughs> uh, but the angle that I took was completely different from the way I'm, I'm preaching today's passage from James uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. So today, I've kind of uncovered a lot after being at TPC here for three years, uh, almost three years. Some of you might say, three years? Has it been three years already? That's pretty fast. Others might be saying, oh, Pastor Chris has been here an eternity. When are you leaving? Right? So it's all kind of a perspective. But uh, today, I've really kind of got to know TPC really well and know kind of what makes it tick. And what I found has been one of the strongest and biggest hogs at TPC is the heart that everyone here has for other people. You see, we all have good sources in some ways. We all care for one another and go out of our way to help one another, call one another, pray for one another, and do so many great things here at TPC that sometimes they even go unnoticed. Of course, there are other areas that we could grow or maybe improve and uh, do better individually and collectively as a church, too. Maybe we could be a little friendlier to guests and members alike. We might need to go out of our way to say hello to someone in the halls we might have never met or don't know too much about. But that's encouraging and trying something new, right? Uh, maybe as a church we could be more positive and focus on the things that are being done well and shout those from the mountaintops. Or if maybe we see a deficiency in the church, we can be one that steps in and tries to help it get a little better. Whether Pastor Chris or someone asks you to or not, right? You know, there was a time or two in my life where I was not always the perfect pastor that you see up here today, right? <laughs> and I do say that in jest, so don't worry. I don't really feel that way. But there were times where I wasn't always the most level-headed person you might see today. I wasn't always the nicest or maybe the fairest person in the world. My pseudo-rebellious teenage and collegiate years uh, probably were some of the years where I didn't like myself the most or the person that I was becoming. But it took a good, hard, sincere look at my heart to realize and to see the shortcomings and the foibles that I had were only a result of my heart and my own self. I couldn't blame someone else. I couldn't say, oh, I'm just, I'm just a procrastinator. So yeah, I didn't finish that project because I was waiting till the perfect time to do it and the perfect time never came. Or yeah, my buddies really influenced me in a bad way and were taking me in a way that I didn't really like to go. No, they're all my decisions. 
and it all came from my heart. You see, I had to make a concerted effort to change the person I was becoming or the person I was at that point in time. So you see, it's certainly possible, right? I'm walking proof of that. And in, in the end, no, we will not be perfect, as Jesus Christ is the only one that has that title, I'm sure the only one that ever will, right? So we don't have to worry about being perfect, we just have to worry about being better and approving our source. Saying kinder words, thinking better thoughts about others and about ourselves. But trust me, it starts with the heart. That is the source from which all of our rivers flow. So do we want them to be abundant with fish that are loving and kind? Or do we want them to be covered with a bacterium that slowly eats away at our source? The choice is up to us. Amen.